Luke chapter number two, starting with verse number one. When you have it, say, I have it. If you don't have it, say, wait a minute. I trust that everybody has it. The word of God declares that it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Serenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. Say own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. I want to preach for a little while using the subject, make room for Jesus. Look at the person beside you and tell them you will never have room. Tell them you got to make room. Clap your hands if you believe what you just said. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Make room for Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, it is quite interesting to note that after it is that Jesus the Christ, who happens to be son of the living God, finishes his work on the cross. When it is that he hung, he bled, he died, and he suffered for the sins of the entire world for the specific purpose of reconciling mankind back to God. The Bible declares that God the Father is so proud of God the Son that God the Father exalts Jesus, or should I say rather that God the Father promotes Jesus. Matter of fact, the Bible teaches us in Philippians chapter 2, starting with verse number 9, that after it is that Jesus humbled himself and became obedient even until the death of the cross. The Bible declares in the ninth verse of Philippians chapter number two, it says, wherefore God have highly exalted him. It is quite interesting to note that the exaltation and the promotion of Jesus the Christ does not take place until Jesus first humbles himself. That is absolutely important because many of us in here under the sound of my voice long to be promoted. But many of us have yet to understand that humility is always a prerequisite for promotion. Many of us in here under the sound of my voice long to get to the next level. Many of us in here, under the sound of my voice, long to climb the ladder of success. Many of us in here, under the sound of my voice, long to go higher. And whether you know it or not, I've come to the understanding the problem is not that we want to be promoted, but the problem is that many of us want to be promoted according to the standards of the world. The world tells us that in order to get the promotion, that in order to get the raise, that in order to go higher, that in order to climb the ladder of success in life, the world says that in order to get there, you've got to fight your way to the top, kick your way to the top, scratch your way to the top, claw your way to the top, step on and step over people and mistreat other people in order to get there. But one thing that the world has failed to understand is that when it is that you take this approach to get to the top you've got to be absolutely careful how it is that you treat people why do you have to be careful how it is that you treat people we've got to be careful how we treat people in achieving success because I've come to the understanding the same people you mistreat you step on and step over in order to get there are the same people you got to see again on your way back down and so therefore, as a consequence, promotion inside of the kingdom is not the same as promotion inside of the world. Whether you know it or not, God declares in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 6, watch, watch this. He says, if you want to go up, you first have to go down. 
how do you know you first have to go down because God says first Peter chapter 5 verse number 6 he says humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and God will exalt you in due time Ladies and gentlemen, it is quite interesting to note that the exaltation and the promotion of Jesus to Christ does not come until Jesus first humbles himself. But it is also absolutely amazing that after it is that Jesus finishes his work on the cross and God the Father is so proud of God the Son, so much to the point that God the Father exalts Jesus and promotes him, the Bible declares that when Jesus is promoted, that God the Father sits Jesus in a place of rest how do you know that it's a place of rest because 99.9% .9 of the places you look throughout scripture after the exaltation of Jesus the Christ the Bible declares that he's now seated at the right hand of the throne of his father anytime you sit down that happens to be a position of rest all throughout scripture after it is that Jesus is promoted the Bible declares that he's seated at the right hand of the throne of his father y'all don't believe me let me give y'all some Bible the Bible declares in Mark chapter Chapter 16, verse number 19, he's seated at the right hand of the throne of his father. Y'all don't believe me? Let me give you some more scripture. The Bible declares in Luke chapter 22, starting with verse number 69, he's seated at the right hand of the throne of his father. Acts chapter 2, verses 34 through 35, he's seated at the right hand of the throne of his father. But it's not just in Acts. The Bible declares in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20, he's seated at the right hand of the throne of his father. First Peter chapter 3, starting with with verse 22 he's seated at the right hand of the throne of his father Hebrews chapter 10 verse 12 he's seated at the right hand of the throne of his father it is quite interesting to note that after it is that Jesus is exalted everywhere that you look throughout scripture 99.9% .9 of the time he's seated in a place of rest because he's seated at the right hand of the throne of his father ladies and gentlemen there's only one place in sacred scripture after Jesus is exalted and after Jesus is promoted that Jesus is no longer seated at the right hand of the throne of his father but in Acts chapter 7 starting with verse number 55 the Bible declares after his exaltation in this particular instance he's not seated at the right hand of the throne of his father but he's now standing at the right hand of the throne of his father ladies and gentlemen the question has to be raised that if Jesus worked that hard on the cross to save us ladies and gentlemen you know he had to work hard because many of us can testify preacher straight up I wasn't no easy person to save I was a hot mess but in spite of me being a hot mess he worked extremely hard just to save me ladies and gentlemen the question has to be raised that, that if Jesus works that hard on the cross to save us so much to the point that God the Father is proud of God the Son and God the Father exalts and promotes Jesus and he's seated at the right hand of the throne of his father be it that Jesus is now in a position of rest because he's worked so hard the question has to be raised that if he's resting that much then what would cause Jesus to stand in this particular instance ladies and gentlemen I'm glad you asked that question when it is that we survey Acts chapter number six in Acts chapter number six we are introduced to a young man by the name of Stephen who happens to be one of the first deacons of the early church but when it is that you jaywalk from Acts chapter number 6 to Acts chapter number 7 we find that Stephen is not just a deacon but he's also an evangelist of the early church in other words how do you know that Stephen is an evangelist we know that Stephen is an evangelist because in Acts chapter number 7 Stephen is now preaching a message to a Jewish crowd and the Jews do not like the message that Stephen is preaching in other words he stands and he says boldly to the Jews he says your fathers were messed up and the reason your fathers were messed up because every prophet that God sent your fathers rejected the prophets but then he turns around and tells them about themselves he says not only were your fathers messed up but I see the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree because you are more messed up than your fathers and the reason he says they are more messed up than their fathers because their fathers rejected the prophets but watch this their sons who Stephen is talking to in Acts chapter number 7 they didn't just reject the prophets they rejected the person that the prophet spoke of who happened to be Jesus the Christ he says you rejected Jesus so much to the point that the savior of the world 
though you just killed him on the cross and ladies and gentlemen it is absolutely interesting to note that the crowd that he's preaching to is so mad that the Bible declares in Acts chapter number 7 that because Stephen speaks truth to opposition the Bible declares that his enemies come together on one accord against him is it not strange how some of your enemies don't like each other but as soon as you stand for Jesus Christ your enemies have a way of coming together on one accord just to pile up and gang up against you the Bible declares that his enemies come together on one accord and when they get together on one accord the Bible declares that they drive Stephen out of the city when they drive him out of the city they stone him to death because they don't like the message that he preaches because his message challenges them ladies and gentlemen can I pause for the specific purpose of speaking to every Christian in here under the sound of my voice if nobody inside of your circle is challenging you to do better you need to find you a new circle if nobody inside of your circle is challenging you to go higher you need to find you some new friends the Bible declares that he challenges them and the Bible declares they don't like his message so they come together on one accord they drive him out of the city and they stone him to death while Stephen is being stoned he looks into heaven and the Bible declares when he's looking into heaven in Acts chapter number 7 starting with verse number 55 that Jesus the Christ is no longer seated at the right hand of the throne of his father but watch this because Stephen stands for Jesus Jesus turns around and stands for Stephen ladies and gentlemen can I pause to tell somebody that if you make up inside of your mind that I'm getting ready to stand for Jesus that God will never leave you God will never forsake you but God will always be with you it's hard to stand for Jesus but if you make up inside of your mind regardless of what consequences I got to face that I'm still going to stand for Jesus if you stand for Jesus I dare you to celebrate Christ right now because God will stand for you As God the Father was proud of Jesus, the Son, the Bible declares that Jesus is so proud of Stephen that the life that he lived causes Jesus to stand on his behalf. And ladies and gentlemen, when he stands on Stephen's behalf, watch this, he's giving Stephen a standing ovation because Jesus is proud of Stephen. Why is he proud of Stephen? He's proud of Stephen because Stephen speaks truth in the face of opposition. Allow me to pause to tell somebody that making room for Jesus is never easy. It is never easy because whenever you decide that I'm getting ready to make room for Jesus, you've got to do it in a culture just as Stephen had to do it in a culture that totally opposes the message of Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, is it not amazing that the world doesn't mind you mentioning the name God? They just don't want you to talk about Christ. The world doesn't mind you mentioning the word spirituality. They just don't want you to talk about Christ. The problem with the world is that the world wants God, but they want to bypass Jesus in order to get there and Jesus himself said that is absolutely impossible he says in John chapter 14 verse 6 that I am the way I'm the truth and the life and no man comes to the father except by me matter of fact the Bible then echoes that in Acts chapter 4 verse 12 there is no other name under heaven that is given among men whereby we must be saved that name is Jesus the Christ anybody can testify that at the name of Jesus every knee has got to bow at the name of Jesus every tongue has got to confess at the name of Jesus they got to bow they got to confess that Jesus the Christ is Lord but the reason that we can stand in the face of opposition if you stand for Jesus then God's going to stand for you Stephen takes a stand for Jesus and because he stands for Jesus, Jesus doesn't leave him hanging. But this is the only place in scripture after Jesus is promoted that he's no longer sitting down. But something about the life of Stephen causes Jesus to stand up. 
In other words, watch this. When he stands, he's standing not just to relieve Stephen, but he's standing to give him a standing ovation because he's pleased. Ladies and gentlemen, the problem with many of us is that many of us want to please everybody except for the God that we serve. But I want my life to please God so much to the point that it causes him to stand on my behalf. I want my words to please God so much to the point that it causes him to get up out of his seat. I want my thoughts to please God so much to the point that it causes him to stand on my behalf. Anybody can testify. I want my actions to please God so much to the point that even though he's tired because of the work that he did on the cross, what about your life is going to cause God to stand up? Whenever you decide to make room for Jesus, it is absolutely difficult because it causes you to do it in a culture that opposes Christ. But allow me to pause to tell somebody, in spite of how difficult it is, if you stand for Jesus, Jesus will stand for you. Ladies and gentlemen, the question has to be raised, if that be the case, Pastor Beavers, what does it take to make room for Jesus? The first thing that it takes is sacrifice. Everybody shout sacrifice. Ladies and gentlemen, to sacrifice is for somebody to inconvenience themselves for the greater good of somebody else. In other words, you inconvenience yourself not because you're getting something out the deal, but you inconvenience yourself for the greater good of somebody else. Ladies and gentlemen, that proves to be true inside of the text because when it is that we survey the text, the Bible declares in verses 1 through 5, watch this, that Mary and Joseph are traveling from Nazareth to Bethlehem. That really doesn't mean much to you until you come to the understanding that the journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem is a 70-mile journey. In other words, they are traveling from Nazareth to Bethlehem of Judea for the specific purpose that Jesus, the Savior of the world, can be born. Now, ladies and gentlemen, watch this. They make a 70-mile journey with no car. They make a 70-mile journey, and Ford Motor Company has not yet been invented. In other words, they are traveling 70 miles. Perhaps they are traveling by foot. The Bible does not say. But if, in fact, they are not traveling by foot, perhaps they are traveling by a wild beast. The Bible does not say. Anytime you travel 70 miles inside of a vehicle, it takes us, if we are doing the speed limit, at least an hour and 15 minutes to make it to our destination. Uh, but, ladies and gentlemen, they don't have a motor vehicle. All they have is Ike and Mike. And the Bible declares that she sacked Sacrifice so much to the point that she inconveniences herself and either she walks to Bethlehem and if she doesn't walk, she rides a wild beast in order to get to Bethlehem that the Savior of the world can now be born. Ladies and gentlemen, in order for her to get there, she first had to inconvenience herself. But why did she inconvenience herself? She inconvenienced herself that the world might be able to see Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, can I pause for the specific purpose of speaking to every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, every parent, every child under the sound of my voice. Whenever you make room for Jesus, it causes you to inconvenience yourself. In other words, watch this. Many Many of us as Christians want a convenient Christianity. But when you give your life to Christ, he never promised that your life was going to be convenient. Uh, but sometimes you got to inconvenience yourself, not for you, but so the world is able to see Christ. Have you not considered, New Rising Star, that sometimes the only Jesus that people are able to see is the Jesus that is inside of us? That sometimes the only Bible that people are able to read is the word of God that is inside of us? And sometimes that word causes you to hold your tongue when you feel like cussing somebody out. Sometimes you got to inconvenience yourself that the world is able to see Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, you ever found yourself in a position inside of the world when somebody said something out the way and they didn't just say anything out the way but they tried to embarrass you in public and because they tried to embarrass you in public, everything inside of you wanted to slap the taste out of their mouth and everything inside of you wanted to lay hands on them but not in the holy kind of way? Have you ever found yourself inside of a situation, watch this, where you wanted to do something that was not godly but watch this, you inconvenienced yourself 
yourself that somebody else was able to see the God inside of you. Sometimes forgiving people causes you to sacrifice. Sometimes being able to do what God wants you to do, it causes you to have to sacrifice. But ladies and gentlemen, when you inconvenience yourself for God, can I pause to tell somebody that God will inconvenience himself for you? But not only does making room for Jesus require sacrifice, but also watch this. The second thing that it requires is that making room for Jesus requires us to realize that God uses hard circumstances as transportation to get us to the place where we need to be. How do you know this? It's right there inside of the text. Watch this new rising star. Uh, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but he was raised in Nazareth. I'm going to say that again. He was raised in Nazareth, but he was born in Bethlehem. And so here it is. Mary and Joseph, before this journey, they find themselves in Nazareth. They are in Nazareth, and the text suggests in verses 1 through 5 that they are traveling to Bethlehem because Caesar Augustus has put out a decree for the world to be taxed. And in order to pay your taxes, you had to go to your hometown in order to pay your taxes. And so watch this. In verses number 1 through 5, Mary and Joseph think that they're traveling to Bethlehem just to be taxed. And they don't even realize that the picture is bigger than what it is that they are able to see. They think that I'm going to Bethlehem to be taxed, but they don't even realize that the prophet spoke a long time ago in Micah chapter 5, verse number 2, that the Savior of the world is to be born in Bethlehem. Now, ladies and gentlemen, anytime God speaks, because God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent, anytime God speaks, his word has to come to pass. And because God speaks through his prophet Micah in Micah chapter number five verse number two that the savior is not to be born in Nazareth but the savior is to be born in Bethlehem God uses this circumstance of Mary and Joseph being taxed in order to get them to Bethlehem so that his word can come to pass now ladies and gentlemen this was not an easy circumstance it was absolutely difficult because mind you they are traveling 70 miles and they don't have a motor vehicle they are traveling 70 miles and Mary is not just pregnant she's great with child. Her, her feet are swollen and, and she's in her third trimester and anybody who's been pregnant you know that in your third trimester you can't do the same things you used to be able to do in your first trimester. In other words, she's facing a difficult situation and she thinks that she's going there just to be taxed but she doesn't even realize that God is using her difficult situation to get her to the place that she needs to be that his word is able to come to pass many of us in here under the sound of my voice have been praying the wrong prayer because every time you face a difficult problem in life and every time you face a difficult circumstance in life and every time you face a difficult situation in life many of us are begging for God God I need you to get it of my problems and God is speaking back to us the same thing that you are asking me to get rid of is the same thing that I'm using as transportation to get you to the place that I desire for you to be that my word is able to come to pass inside of your life anybody can testify that had it not been for your difficulties you wouldn't know how to pray like you pray you wouldn't know how to fast like you fast you wouldn't know how to worship like you worship you wouldn't know how to lift your hands the way you lift your hands I think it'll take 30 seconds and celebrate God for every problem celebrate God for every trial celebrate God for every mountain it was the mountain that got you over hallelujah he uses their difficult circumstance as transportation just to get them to the place that he ordained for them to be, that his word can come to pass. Ladies and gentlemen, God will use whoever he needs to use to get you to the place that his word can come to pass in your life. God Almighty, you want God to kill your ex, but God Almighty, God used your ex. He used your ex to teach you how to forgive. He used your ex to teach you how to love. He, he used them as transportation. And guess what? He didn't just use your ex. He used the person you with right now. 
That's why they don't do everything you want them to do. And you're asking for God to take away your problems. And the thing you want God to remove is the thing that God is using to teach you how to be humble. Uses my circumstance, no matter how difficult, as transportation to get me to the place that he desires for me to be, that his word can come to pass. But thirdly, what does it take to make room for Jesus? Watch this, making room for Jesus sometimes requires us to keep going when you feel like quitting. Now, I know y'all super safe. But I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the precious gift of the Holy Spirit and fire baptized and on the Lord's side. And even I sometimes feel like quitting. I know you don't never feel like quitting, but, but sometimes somebody can just be honest. You, you just feel like giving up. Sometimes you feel like throwing in the towel. Ladies and gentlemen, here it is that Mary is traveling from Nazareth to Bethlehem, which happens to be a 70-mile journey. No motor vehicle, pregnant in a third trimester, feet are swollen, body is aching, body is stretched out. Perhaps she's traveling by foot, kind of mighty, and she doesn't have tennis shoes because they wore sandals. So she's traveling dusty roads, and if she's not traveling by foot, she's traveling by beast. Can you imagine being that great with child and you got to straddle yourself up? You ever seen a pregnant woman? Sometimes you can barely get inside of the car. Let alone you talking about me getting on top of a beast and riding for 70 miles. Can you imagine that perhaps Mary wanted to quit? Perhaps Mary wanted to throw in a towel. Perhaps Mary felt like giving up. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm so glad that when she felt like quitting, she kept going. Where would we be if Mary had a stopped? Would we have the savior of the world? And, and somebody in here under the sound of my voice, both man and woman knows exactly what it's like to be standing in the shoes of Mary. You, you know exactly what it's like to feel like quitting. But the reason Mary was not able to quit is because the world needed a savior. And, and there's somebody in here under the sound of my voice. You want to quit, but the reason I can't quit is because somebody needs me. You, you want to clock out on your job, but my kids need me. My spouse needs me. My church needs me. And every time that I feel like quitting, God whispers inside of my ear, be not weary and well-doing, but in due season, you'll reap if you faint not. You won't quit. But every time I get tired of waiting on God, I hear him whispering in Isaiah chapter 40, verse number 31, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They'll mount up on wings as eagles. Run and not be weary. They'll walk and they shall not fall. I want to quit, but I still keep going in spite of it. Sometimes you got to keep going with tears in your eyes. Sometimes you got to keep going with a smile on your face and pain inside of your heart. And folk on the outside are looking at you and they think you're happy, but you really ain't happy. You don't even want to come to church because you're afraid somebody gonna ask you how you doing. But you're afraid they are not gonna be sincere. They're gonna be one of them fake saints that says how you're doing, but they really wanna know your business. Yeah, sometimes you, you feel like quitting, but there's something inside of you that got the can't help it. Something inside of you won't allow you to quit that every time I feel like throwing in a towel and every time I say that I'm getting ready to sit down on God, I got a Jeremiah spirit inside of my heart. It's fire inside of my bones. She's in a difficult circumstance and she's feeling like quitting. But she can't quit because the world needs what's inside of her. God Almighty, somebody just missed that. Whatever God placed inside of you, you can't quit because the world needs the dream that is inside of you. 
The world needs the vision that is inside of you. The, the world needs what God has placed inside of you. And sometimes you can't quit not because you don't want to quit. You don't quit because somebody else needs what's inside of you. Last thing you got to do to make room for Jesus. Text says in verse number seven, I can tell that Mary was not a sister. Because when she finally gets to Bethlehem, after traveling for 70 miles, feet swollen, body stretched out, body aching, she makes it to her destination. And I guarantee you she didn't get there in an hour and 15 minutes. Realistically, it probably took her about two to three days. Traveling outside, who is to say that it was not raining? But when she finally gets there in verse number seven, the Bible declares that she's pregnant and all she wants is a room to lay her head. She gets to the motel, hotel, Holiday Inn. Y'all ain't that safe. When she finally gets there, she says she needs a room. And the innkeeper says, we don't have any room for you. And the Bible declares in verse number 7, Luke chapter number 2, they laid Jesus in a manger because there was no room for him in the inn. Now, ladies and gentlemen, a manger is not what you see at the nativity scene. They dress it up and make it look extremely pretty, but it was not that pretty. A manger is a trough where pigs eat out of. A manger is a trough where animals eat out of. What mother would lay her holy child in a dirty place? That's a message all by itself. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm so glad that Jesus wasn't afraid to get dirty. Yeah, because some of us in here can testify that to save me, he had to get dirty. He didn't just reach down. He had to reach way down. I'm glad he wasn't afraid to get dirty because somebody can testify that because he got dirty, I'm able to be forgiven of my dirty thoughts. That because he got dirty, I'm able to be forgiven of my dirty words. That because he got dirty, I'm able to be forgiven of my dirty deeds. Anybody can testify, I'm glad that he went too clean to get dirty. That because he got dirty, I now become clean. I'm washed in the blood of Jesus. They have to lay them in a dirty place because there's no room for them in the end. But ladies and gentlemen, this is the thing about the text that I don't like. It's not that the end keeper does not have room. He's just not willing to put anybody else out to make room. Many of us stand in the shoes of the end keeper. You do know that the Bible declares Revelation chapter number 3 starting around verse number 20. Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Jesus is such a gentleman that he's knocking at the door of all of our hearts and he's not getting ready to barge his way in. He's waiting on you to make room. You'll never have room for Jesus. He, he's saying you gotta be able to make some room. He's standing at the door and knocking and many of us are just like the innkeeper. God, I wanna let you in, but I don't have any room inside of my heart. Some of us are so full of what we want that we don't have room for what we need. What are we so full of that we can't make room for Jesus? Some of us are so full of lies that we can't make room for Jesus. Some of us are so full of bitterness and unforgiveness sitting in church and we can't make room for Jesus. Some of us are so full of hatred and we have no room for Jesus. Some of us are so full of lust, so much to the point that we don't have any room for the Savior of the world. And some of us are just plain old full of bull. That we don't have room for the Savior of the world. But ladies and gentlemen, can I pause to tell somebody, you'll never have room for Jesus. You got to make room for Jesus.
I'm going to say that again because somebody missed it. You'll never have room for Jesus. You got to make room. I found out people do what they want to do. If you want to do it, you make time for it. You'll, you'll never have time for Bible study. You got to make time. You'll never have time for Sunday school. You got to make time. You'll never have time for Sunday morning worship. It requires you to make time. Somebody can testify that when Jesus knocks at the door of my heart, it is not that I don't have room. I just don't want to put somebody else out of my heart in order to make room for Jesus. Who's stopping you from making room from the Savior of the world? Who are you so loyal to that you can't put them out your life? Is it that good to you? That they can block your relationship with God. Sometimes you got to put somebody out in order to make room for Jesus. I dare you to take out your cell phones. Take them out. Hurry up. Take out your cell phones. We got so many people that we call friends. And they ain't nothing but associates. We got 5,000 friends on Facebook, but who's really your friend? Whoever has a space in your phone that's holding you back from doing what God wants you to do, I dare you to delete them right now. I know ain't nobody told you to do that in church, but I'm so serious. Whoever has a space in your phone or a space inside of your heart, this is the day that somebody's getting ready to get delivered. Somebody can't make room for Jesus because you still got an ex inside of your system. And even though you are not physically around your ex, they got a hold on your mind so much to the point that every time you think about them, your mood just changes. But God told me to tell somebody that today is the last day that somebody else is going to take space inside of your heart. God's getting ready to rid them out of your system. Sometimes you got to let some people go. Sometimes you got to let some things go. God Almighty, it wasn't that it wasn't good while it lasted. It was good while it lasted, but it's out of date. Many of us are sick because many of us treat relationships like spoiled milk. In other words, it's good as long as it's in date. But whenever you start drinking it beyond the date, what was intended to be of nourishment and of sustenance to you is no longer good, but it's full. But because you keep on drinking it, it makes you sick. There's somebody getting here under the sound of my voice. There's somebody you was in a relationship with, and the relationship was good as long as it was in season. But when God said that the season was up, you couldn't get away from the person. And because you couldn't let them go, you keep drinking from that nasty fountain. And that's the reason that many of us are sick. You never have room. Tell somebody you got to make room. Now remember now, whenever you make room for Jesus, it's difficult. It's difficult because it requires you to do it in a culture like Stephen did it that is totally opposed to Christ. But allow me to pause to tell somebody that if you get up the nerve and the audacity to make room for Jesus in a culture that is opposed to Christ, the reason you can do it is because if you stand for Jesus, Jesus will turn around and stand for you. How do you know that the culture is opposed to Christ? The culture understands you not being able to hang out with the fellas because I got to go to work. I got to go make that overtime. Okay then, dog, go make that overtime. Go get your money. I understand. They understand that. But when you say the reason I can't right. hang out is because I got to come to church. Church! Are you crazy? And so watch this. I'm not telling you that this is going to be easy. But I can tell you that if you stand for Jesus, 
then Jesus won't leave you hanging. But if Jesus stood for Stephen, then Jesus will stand for you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that really doesn't mean much to you until you come to the understanding that Stephen is at the end of his life. He's at the end of his life. And the Bible declares that God the Son is so proud of Stephen that he stands on his behalf. When he's standing on his behalf, he's given Stephen a standing ovation. Ladies and gentlemen, anytime you see a tombstone, the most important thing about the stone is not the beginning and the ending date, but the dash that is in between. Ladies and gentlemen, watch this. Jesus is so proud of Stephen that he gives him a standing ovation, not because of his birth or his death date, but because of his dance that was in between. In other words, his life was so pleasing unto God that it caused Jesus to stand on his behalf. Ladies and gentlemen, mind you, Jesus has been working on the cross and because he worked so hard to save us because all of us in here was a mess from the pulpit to the pews. He's absolutely tired. But there's something about the life of Stephen that causes him to get up out of his seat. Ladies and gentlemen, can I pause to tell somebody whenever you stand for Jesus that God will be pleased. Whenever you stand for Jesus, God will stand for you. And when he stands for you, he's not just standing, but God God's going to give you a standing ovation. Anybody can testify, I'm tired of spending money that I don't have to impress people that really don't like me in the first place. I'm tired of pleasing everybody else except for God. When people didn't wake me up this morning, people didn't clothe me inside of my right mind, people didn't pay my bills, it was nobody but Jesus. That's the reason I still got breath inside of my body. I just spent my whole life standing for the world, but I'm getting ready to spend the rest of my life and I'll stand for Jesus. Is there anybody in here with a made of mind that I'm getting ready to stand? I'll stand for Jesus. I'll stand for Jesus with tears in my eyes. I'll stand for Jesus with burdens in my heart. I'll stand for Jesus when I feel like standing. And I'll stand for Jesus when I don't feel like standing. Is there anybody in here who can stand to your feet? Lift your hands and testify to God right now that in season and out of season, I'll stand for Jesus. You'll never have room for God. But you gotta make room for Jesus. Squeeze your neighbor and tell your neighbor. Make room. Make room for Jesus. Folks talk about your bad, but I'm still gonna make room. That if I can make room for a drink of alcohol, that if I can make room for a drug in my system, then I'll make room, I'll make room for Jesus. You thought that drink was something, and you thought that drug was something, and you thought that man was something, and you thought that woman was something. But is there anybody in here who can testify right now that can't nobody shoot me like Jesus? Can't nobody me like the Lord. I beg you to grab your neighbor and show your neighbor you stood for the world. But it's time to stand for Jesus. Encourage your neighbor. Squeeze your neighbor and show your neighbor that if you stand for God, God's going to stand for you. I'm glad right now that when the world tries to storm me that Jesus is standing he's standing on my behalf is there anybody in here who can thank God right now that the devil is not the only person that is on my tracks this morning but the power declares in Psalms 23 Verse number six. Surely, goodness and mercy, good 
goodness said he gave me what I did not deserve. Mercy, he held back what I really did deserve. They followed me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever.